budget about three blocks, quite 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 large. Wow. And the 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 pieces already installed, but we couldn't go back to do the lighting. Yeah. Correct. So that's what I'm going to be going now to do the lighting sequence, which is quite challenging because there's just an infinity amount of lines. And, but that, that I guess that's what I love. So mm -hmm. it's what I call the romance with the unknown to get there and say, okay, yeah. what am I gonna do now? <laughs> but you just found different avenues to channel both your intensity and your artistic uh, sensibility. So we're very, very happy for you. Yes, yeah, I, 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 I celebrate life. You have to, you know, as, you know me. As do we, Nessa. <laughs> yes, you do, exactly. <laughs> I adore you both. Thank you for supporting me. I'm, uh, we've, it's you been know, our pleasure. I, I, uh, I'm extremely grateful, you know, that, you know, I was so young and you still have the vision and that you love my work. Okay. How could I, how could I ever forget that, right? <laughs> well, here we are. We're, we're, um, we're live now, not only on Zoom, uh, with Griminessa Amoros, um, having a conversation with Jeff, her old friend and art collector. Uh, and Emily Harris and I are in New York after having driven through a blizzard to get here. Uh, so thank you for forgiving us for this late start and welcome to friends and colleagues on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Uh, Griminessa, it's such a really ecstatic pleasure to have you with us. And um, the, light in, the light that's flashing in your work is still in my heart and body after a meeting together a couple of months ago in your studio down in Tribeca. Right. Did I understand it correctly that uh, Jeff, that uh, you and Jeff had um, somehow met at, at, was it, you mentioned a public school, was that PS1? Or something downtown. Yeah, that like was, that? believe uh, it was this very well-known organization that I still is still now, and it's going to be going through major renovation. It was Rio. ABC No Rio. ABC No Rio. Yes. Oh my God! Do you realize that last week we had one of the founders of ABC No Rio on the show? Of course, you were there for a while. Yes, I heard. I heard, and I said to myself, "What? What an incredible coincidence!" Because that actually was my. My first show in the in the, in in the states because at that time I was going to the uh, Art Students League because they have quite a not really to take courses but you know they have uh, spaces for us to work and it was an exhibition of uh, they have selected thirteen artists you know from the Art Students League and to show at the ABC in Rio. Do you realize that that? That space, ABC No Rio, was the consequence of our squatting and occupying a building on Delancey Street on wow. January 8th of uh, the year uh, 1980. Wow. And uh, I had invited Joseph Boys mm -hmm. to come down there to the show to help us uh, break into the building. And his authenticity in the identifiable art world made it possible for uh, the collab organization and, and um, eventually even me, I showed also at ABC No Rio, but that ABC No Rio space was given to the uh, collective um, as a sort of trade off, if you will, for uh, vacating the building on Delancey Street. And I believe um, we just had a revision, a revisit of that show uh, five years ago at the Fuentes Gallery. So you were there on the ground floor of, of that social engagement progress pro project. And at the time, what was your sort of vision of uh, yourself um, as an activist of some kind or somebody also from you know, Peru who lived through perhaps difficult times and uh, coming to New York also beginning from the ground up with a postcard and a suitcase, <laughs> right? Your story. It is true, yes. What, what was the vision of yourself? What, what was, if you remember or want to, if you feel want, you want to share. Oh, yes. 
I, I mean, I remember quite everything like it was yesterday. I came to New York in 1984 and the exhibition was in 1985. So that's how long uh, Jeffrey and uh, Susan and myself, we know each other. And, um, and I had to say, you know, we have to be thankful, all of us artists, that they still, you know, exist um, collectors with such a genuine passion for the arts and to follow the career of, of, you know, of an artist sometimes for many years, like in the case of Jeff and Susan, it happens to be here, right? So um, I'm grateful for that. The, the exhibition, uh, our exhibition that we had, I, I can't remember the title, but it was in 1985. And I had a couple of paintings besides the one, uh, not that many, the ones besides the one that Jeff bought, Enchanted Forest. And it was uh, quite a very exciting place, ABC No Rio, if you could recall, for me at least, coming from uh, Lima, Peru, because it was just to cross the park, it was exciting. Um, but that was the reason why I was there in New York City. So I never felt even uh, threatened about uh, the, 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 you know, how at that time, I don't know if you remember, the park was quite colorful. And I mean colorful because of the, you know, the drugs and all the other little extras that it might have been. And so sometimes uh, it was quite a challenge, you know, if you want to go to ABC Rio at night. Yeah. About, um, I actually, you know, was, I came from Peru from a military um, uh, government, right? Uh, Velasco government, the Peru for many, many years. He just, um, it was a democratic with Belaunde and he just made a coup and then took over. So uh, when you grow up uh, in a military system, uh, any, any other exposure becomes, you just become very grateful. Uh, and it, it might not alert me as it might alert someone that has born, for example, in the United States, that they have never been exposed to those kind of, you know, bombs or the tanks or the military. For us, it was, okay, the, day, the bread of every day, right? The yes. bombs or even what people pass through the shining path. So you know how as humans are, we tend to get um, accustomed sometimes and we get into habits and we don't realize sometimes that we are living through those uh, very uh, dangerous circumstances. So I think that had helped me as to have a very good base. Uh, for example, when uh, we are here in New York City and going through some of uh, um, disturbs and you know the pandemia and what it happened you know in Washington and all of the ex experiences that we all have gone through through the last year. So so Grimanessa what you're saying in, in a way when when we met and spoke a few months ago we talked about the pandemic and the trauma and it sounds like we're having a conversation again about uh, how trauma can in some way help us to cut through the, uh, let's say, more superficial parts of our lives, the things we take for granted, and really come to the core of ourselves and what we have to give and what we deeply appreciate and what our values are. Um, so well, I agree. I agree. Because, you know, as artists, I think we have the, uh, the responsibility and the hope of a lot of our other humans that we are gonna bring that other ways of looking at life, correct? So uh, we, myself, you know, we constantly as our value, you know, in this society, I, I mean, how much we are gonna, what is the value to be an artist uh, on, uh, today? And I constantly go back to the same thoughts about what, what will the world will be without artists? Yeah. What would it be? I mean, if, if the world were a utopia, uh, art would not have the sort of place that it has in our society today. But hopefully we're here to, to wake up, to heal, and to create a better space where everyone can live and where the earth can survive. And I'm very, very honored that you're joining Emily and I 
to talk about your work today. We have about 60 minutes to chat with each other, now maybe 55 minutes, and then we open up the space for others to participate. And as um, we like to, to describe, the tuning fork is a vibration, a space, uh, a, an environment, a climate to adjust to, to tune into, to resonate from. So these meetings with cultural activists, artists such as yourselves, are opportunities to really immerse ourselves in your sensibility, the sensibility of our guests, perhaps even a little bit of contagious process happens that we're uh, inspired and we see the world just maybe for a moment through your sensibilities and, and your eyes and your experience, Brimanessa. So um, this conversation is like, you know, having a talk at a dinner table with lots of friends, um, a little bit casual and perhaps intimate uh, within certain restrictions perhaps, but, you know, um, Thank you for your generosity and your your courageous work as a as a cultural warrior. It's great. Thank you. Thank you, John, and you know Emily for having me here. You know, it's a greater, uh, it's a wonderful platform. You know, to exchange ideas, basically. You know, and to get inspired from each other. Yeah, and and perhaps there is, uh, as Emily and I believe in our hearts that there is. We know there's a movement whether it's an organized movement or not, but giving the idea of an institute, you know, as a conceptual art idea, but to actually institutionalize mm -hmm. this program, the Institute for Cultural Activism, is really an invitation for networking and collaborating uh, internationally. Mm -hmm. So we really aspire to having a very accessible and deep um, website where, where people can go online and find um, uh, resources, um, sanctuary, and activation for their projects and, and uh, you know, to be informed about what's going on. Sure. So we will, of course, uh, have your website listed, people to learn about your work and find this interview, of course. Um, so yeah. How do you feel that, you know, your experience in the contemporary art world um, began? And it's like, what are your roots in this, in this kind of, uh, you know, the process of challenging perhaps how we see things and how we see ourselves? Well, you know, I always uh, look um, as to be an artist I always wanted, I knew that I was going to be an artist since I, at least I was going to be 10 years old. Ah. And so uh, for me, being an artist was something that uh, I guess I would be until I go to another life. And that way of thinking, it truly helps because when you, as a young artist, you get a lot of rejections. And so that sometimes might stop the action, right? To keep on being, you know, to keep activating others with what you do because you lose, sometimes you might lose confidence or you question what are you doing? So for me, um, I did something very interesting that I think I would like to share, which is uh, I start collecting all of the uh, rejection letters that I will be receiving you know, from grants and you name it, a, sort, a whole assort of it. And so, so instead of getting up, you know, sad or upset about this rejection letter, I, I will read it and then I will treat it as a page of a book that I was reading and then I will pass it, right? So immediately I will not let it to affect me because what I said to myself, okay, the decision has been made. So if I, you know, have, you know, my tears, or I feel sad about it, what is it that I'm gonna change with the letter that I have received with the resolution? So I said, okay, I start thinking, well, this is the judgment of maybe five, six, seven people. 
and but not necessarily the world is made from billions, right? So not because these five, six, seven individuals doesn't like my work, that doesn't mean that others won't like my work, <laughs> correct? So, so that's how I, I, I dealt, you know, throughout all those years with all those rejections, because trust me, they were a lot and very and plenty. So, um, so that, so that's how I, I never really felt sad. I never, I never play with my confidence because yeah. I said to myself, if I don't believe in myself, how am I not allowed others, right? Yes, to, yes. to have the confidence, the belief in the work that I'm doing, in the, any activism or any, or basically for me, it was always very important to uh, make people think, right? Criminessa, um, you know, we're speaking to each other like, like, like family, like bro brother and sister, and it touches me very much that you're so, you know, tender and intimate about your experiences like this, rejection. But I have a question, two questions, I think may be helpful. Emily and I um, like to understand uh, because from a um, mindful culture, you know, the mindful culture, the meditation movement, um, we, we hear that it's, it's, it's worthwhile, very profitable to um, feel emotion feel it, uh, but not uh, be defined by it, not be constrained by it, but to almost use the emotion like material, like a raw material um, and not be, you know, mobilized or how do you put it, um, controlled by it. Well, you know, I, I, of course I read it, I felt it, you know, cause you have to, in order to pass the page when you read it, you have to understand, you know, supposedly, quote, right? Understand what you're reading. So, no, no, of course I assimilated. And actually, you know, I, I chose that instead of, you know, I smile, you know, you see, so I guess I make myself, um, I create a way of thinking that only will allow me and help to keep on growing as a human being. Do you think that rejection helps us to, to improve, to refine, to be more articulate, more clear, more, well, more effective? I, it, I think it depends, you know, on each individual, 100%. You know, I... I so each individual and yes. each situation. Yes, 100%. Every situation different. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I wouldn't... I would, I'm, I'm sharing something that it worked for me, right? That perhaps is good for someone else to hear it, and perhaps that might work for them too, but not necessarily. I wouldn't ge generalize that that's the way. It, it worked wonderful. It, it made wonders for me. Yeah. So you were, you were going on, and I interrupted you, please forgive me. Um, you were saying about thinking, um, motivating people to think or creating an engine of um, thinking, um, you know, uh, energy or fuel or uh, sparks? Well, I, I often think that uh, we all have our own philosophies and not necessarily mine might be good for you, John, right? So what I, and I always feel that trying to control people also requires a lot of, you know, for me, wasteful energy. So uh, what I try to do with my work is, you know, pose perhaps questions and make, I like to try to make people think, right? With whatever the statement of that project might be. Now, I think that in that process, I'm making the person also become, you know, more inspired, you know, to learn more about perhaps certain area or certain specific element of the artwork. And by that, make them more creative. So, and not necessarily, you know, as an artist, that could go in any field because I, I think that even businessmen, you know, businesswomen, you know, require uh, creativity to, uh, to do better, better things in life. So I, I, that's, that's quite, I like to think 
when I'm doing a project. Uh, the project becomes specific because it's the site, is, is, is the, the history of the architecture, is the community that surrounds it, um, the people that be, are gonna be a part of it. But, I, but at the same time, I like it to make it universal. So this way, the next generation will look at it perhaps differently or, or find the similitudes. We don't know. You know, when I, when I inhabit your work in my mind, when I immerse myself in the memory or awareness of your work, one of the takeaway, you know, is like, there's fluidity. Hmm. There's movement, there's fluidity, there's, there's circulation. Transportation and circulation and transmission of some kind. And that, that just also kind of spiritually and ethereally um, helps me. It's almost like, you know, the Philip Glass music, you know, that kind of continuous um, sensation of environment and uh, particular qualities. Would it be um, interesting perhaps to look at some work together uh, on the screen share? Mm -hmm. And maybe we can, uh, you can help us narrate and mm -hmm. explore a little bit. Uh, Emily's gonna share in the screen now. So at what point in your career is this, is this being made? Uh, this actually, it's, it's recent. This is, I think, 2018. And it's a permanent work um, done in collaboration with uh, the Bronze Museum and, uh, and private collectors. Broad? They are part and private collectors that they are part of the board as Bronx well. Museum. Okay. The Bronze Museum, correct. Because they have a site, another site in Manhattan as well. Uh, Grimanesha, how big is that work that we're looking at? Uh, I would say about maybe, it's, it's what I will think as a medium size is about maybe uh, 16 feet, is is done in is because it's a corner piece. It yeah. has two parts, right? So right. I would say maybe it's about anywhere between sixteen and twenty feet. So as we people. as we see the, the work on the screen, mm -hmm. we're looking into the corner of it in perspective, Correct. right? Correct. Yes. It, we're actually, that's a corner of a room. Correct. And um, I it's uh, the lobby is the lobby of the building. Yeah. Because what happened is that the bronze uh, have a satellite. They're on the uh, second and third and think fourth floor uh, for a lot of residents for artists. It's called Artists in the Marketplace. And so this was the piece that will receive you when you come into the building. Oh, there, man, wow. Mm -hmm. And sure. in the first floor is, uh, I, I'm sure that you re recall, is this, I think it's one of the oldest nonprofit organization, Artist Space, that right. it was in Soho. So on the first floor is artist space. Yeah, uh, a colleague of ours used to work for artist space, and I used to—I I think I showed one of my pieces there, long, long time ago in one of these, you know, public spaces. Those spaces, just for the sake of people who don't know what that means, artist space. Um, these were um, spaces that were appropriated, uh, usually uh, on a very temporary basis. Um, buildings that were vacant or rooms or spaces that were vacant and, and available and um, was a great organization placing artworks, what these days we may even consider long-term pop-up events, you know, <laughs> um, around, around uh, New, the five boroughs in New York. Um, Griminessa, it looks as though you've done quite a lot of, of monumental uh, scale work. Um, I mean, these are large works. You say medium work. Let's, maybe we can move ahead to um, eventually to some larger works. What are we looking at now and where is that? And what were the circumstances about this work? 
This was a, a very interesting project. It was, uh, the name of the piece is called Hedera. And it was done uh, with the Brooklyn, um, it's an organization that commissioned the work called Brick. And then also with the park, uh, the Brooklyn uh, park, and they have concerts every summer. And that piece was going to be commemorating, um, I can't recall now how many years, I think 50 years of the organization. Uh -huh. So that's the reason why uh, this piece was done. And the name Hedera, because you know, I was going to say, well, uh, how I'm going to integrate you know, the park with the scenario and, and create a space for the community you know, to gather. And I realized that Hedera is another word for um, ivy. And I made a lot of research that in the park, there's a lot of different types of ivies and they grow, you know, you know fr very freely all over the park. And so I thought that this was gonna be a very good um, right. name for it and for people uh, to feel that there is also their own park that they were gonna be um, you know, experiencing with a name. And also the curator wanted me to explain like a little bit like, what is Edera means? And I mentioned, I said, no, let's leave it the way, uh, uh, the way it is. So they become some kind of magic of people wanting to know what, was, what is the word about it. And then they will discover about eventually all the different types and learn about their own park that is in the backyard, basically with a lot of homes all around. And this piece was um, also built because what, for every project that I do, I, in, and, and this varies, of course, right? Sometimes our projects with universities and I will always uh, make a point that I want uh, people from the community to be a part of building the piece with me, but that they always have to be from the beginning until the end, uh, more than from, it comes more from a practical um, uh, view because that this helps me uh, not to lose a lot of time in trying to retrain people constantly. And it's, uh, you know, it's a mixture of uh, individuals. Uh, sometimes there are a lot of um, students, uh, people that they have finished their masters in sculpture. Uh, and also the, um, the beautiful part of it is when it's finished, then they bring also their families and their relatives because right. also they want to see why mommy, daddy, or themselves they have been doing, correct? So that's beautiful when, when an opening happens and they, I get introduced to all these other wonderful other relatives of people that they have been creating another smaller community by building you know, this project and- um, I, 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 I beg your pardon, but it suddenly seems quite uh, interesting to us. Perhaps you have a story that really touched you um, in one of these sorts of community uh, engagement processes. Is there something that perhaps you can share with us that um, really somehow moved you in some way or, uh, was you know really satisfying um, with with your with your vision and your values? Well, there there are many, and that's what I think I love. Uh, I love. I don't do it all the time, but I have done uh, quite a lot of public projects because I I love. There's so many stories, John. Uh, I think maybe one is that. Um, I came a little bit, for example, the opening was at 6.30 and I came maybe 6.45. And so the director comes to me very quickly and says, Aubrey Manessa, I have this lady that has been waiting for you for a long time because she wouldn't leave until she spoke with the artist. And so long story short, the lady was maybe in their 80s and he was with her grandkid. And so she mentioned that she wanted just to tell me about that, and this was, you know, a lady that came from very, uh, not an educational background, uh, economically, you know, very, from very low incomes. And so she mentioned that she loved the work because 
it made her hair, um, how, how you said, when you get up, uh, goosebumps, you know, ah. it, it, it make, it make, it make my, my skin feel goosebumps. And she said that she just loved how the light made her feel. And I think that in the work for me, right? I think that that was, for me, was an amazing, uh, one of these stories that I will never forget. And it happened maybe many years ago. And an another one is uh, the fact that you could imagine, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the dramas that they are behind uh, when you're working sometimes in projects that you're uh, with 50, 100 people dependently. So you always have to try to uh, create a balance, you know, in, uh, within yourself and maintain calm because that, that is going to be reflected not only the people that you, is next to you, but also on the work. And what I'm trying to say is that for me, I always try to make sure that there is a generosity on the work. So if, they, if it's an art critic that is gonna be going to see the work, perhaps they're gonna uh, think about the, the reason behind, the intellectual reason as to why I did the work. Then uh, for others would be just um, for people, for people that are interested in technology will be about uh, what kind of power supplies, the electrical hardware that I have used, uh, for others must be just the colors or the lighting itself moving. So I always, um, I'm satisfied when I finish uh, any work that I do because I know that there's gonna be something for someone that they're gonna take back home. Well, what is, what is this? Um image we're seeing here with you and children. Do you in some way uh, mentor? Uh... I used to. I used to do a lot of handmade uh, uh, um, handmade paper, paperwork. And I used to do even having keynotes about uh, how to use handmade paper, how to do it. Because what happened is that I developed, uh, I have in my studio like a lab. And that's what I did with when I was working with paper. I tried to push the boundaries of how, how further I could take uh, handmade paper. And so if you mix uh, abaca with cotton for eight minutes, this had one kind of result that if you mix in, for example, with 15 minutes. So I, I often like to share and, and teach what I know. And obviously children has been always a very, um, I, I love how, generally and honest they always are so yeah i used to do a lot of not so much now of course well now of course but you know in the latest years i i did a little bit less than before now Grimesha, um emily's mother who's in north carolina right now um we just returned from a, a beautiful uh, work retreat with mm -hmm. uh, sally and pete harris um a residency on the beach. She wants to know where that previous work was located. The uh, image we had in the night scene. Uh, which one? This this one outdoors here. That. Oh, that was um, uh, my God. Uh, the park in Brooklyn, uh, Prospect Park. Prospect Park. Prospect Park. Yeah, was yeah. in Prospect Park. And that was, uh, and, a, and, and then across, right, right there is the band shell, that is an iconic, you know, uh, place for musicians to have a lot of festivals. It's really great. Oh, it's almost like you're, there's a, a resonation, a resonance between the band shell and the object. Of yeah. course, of course, because what happened? We were talking about architecture, and of course, we could get deeper and deeper in each work. Uh, the basically the the shape of Hedera, what I did is that is the shape of the um, band shell, but the band shell is horizontal. So what I did is I turned the band shell upside down. Yeah. So this way they do have this communication because they were, they're very close. As you see, uh, the musician is performing just very near to the piece to Hedera. So it's like, it's like you created from your installation a bigger installation with the resonance between those those two, uh, you know, great objects. And uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it was very interesting because people even will use their towels 
and then they will launch uh, you know upside down i mean it's you know and and then like you said the experiences the the comments that i hear from people are just like incredible yeah and that was a temporary work about how long was it available or how long was it public they were a couple of months yes That's they crazy. were i think since april may june july also. about four or five months i think five months yeah so for 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 people and even me i i'd love to know how you sort of transitioned into this kind of technology and um you know still keeping in your bigger picture the idea of community and universality and i know that you had a kind of transformative experience in iceland um, yes. where you right. described i think you described that you even had a photo camera with you but you didn't even use the photo camera because you were so sort of um you know in a beautiful way traumatized by these extraordinary lights of the northern light is that uh, something that you could sort of help us understand that that moment in your life well i think that uh the best things that happens you know in life sometimes at, at least at, to myself are the ones that they are very unexpected you know it was just very simple one night i couldn't sleep uh and then i went out and i saw i, I saw this sky that i actually didn't immediately knew what I was looking at. And so I was so mesmerized that um, I immediately wanted to reach, as you mentioned, for my camera. But then I know uh, sometimes I, I could be a little bit of a perfectionist. And then I was going to be concerned about having the right frame for the, the picture. And so I decided that I really, sometimes you cannot do two things well at the same time. So I decided that I wanted to leave the moment. I wanted to feel uh, looking at this light, uh, concentrating in the colors and perhaps changes and the stars. And so I, I did. I don't have any of my real photographs of those of, of that moment. But I, when as I, as I was looking at it, I completely recall this moment when I say um, how important for me was to. If I could only share this with others, how could I do it, right? So I, I thought that it was so un, unbelievable, this experience, but I was feeling these magical moments that I also wanted to share this with others. So I, be, I began to have a task and my goal was to find how could I share light because light is ephemeral and that's also another part of the light that I, I obviously love and enjoy working with, the ephemeral part of it that is so important in so many layers, but how could I make it, how could I make others be able to see it? And so I start researching, I start working with uh, theater lighting, but I didn't like it because it was, they get very hot and they're not good for the environment and you have to change it every couple of three, four months, the filters. So my time working with uh, theater lighting was quite short. And then that was the time that LEDs were starting to come out. But LEDs at that time was very forbidden. They were very, very uh, expensive. And it took, me a little, it took me a little time to be able to, to have the project into that I would have been able to use the LEDs. Kriminesha, I had the unusual experience of knowing the person in Switzerland who activated through their company, the technology that developed L L L LCDs. Mm -hmm. And the first product was the, um, you know, the Texas instrument, you know, uh, LED screens, right? Exactly, yes. So it's, uh, it's a little bizarre for me that you know, to recognize that, you know, this technology began with a, a button push you know, in uh, in Switzerland, um, that activated the industry, uh, and actually that business, that corporation, lost millions of dollars with with their investment in LED, mm -hmm. and then later on they realized, well, we we blew it, you know. <laughs> but anyway, it's a side story, of course. Um, Grimanesha, when you mentioned like this sensation that you're there with the northern lights in Iceland. And you don't want to sort of 
You see, I have this idea that I call sublime trauma. Maybe we discussed together when we were together that like art creates a kind of shock or a stunning experience that arrests or suspends our normal mind, our normal mechanical thinking process. And so there's this stun, like you seem to describe in Iceland, and you don't want to disrupt that immersion, that appreciation, that engagement with another process, like taking a picture. So then you inhabit it, you live in it, you're, you exist in that experience for a sustained time, unbreaking, your unbroken concentration. And I think that's a very, very helpful tool for um, anyone who's navigating cultural expression to recognize this does not have to come from alcohol, drinking, or you know, taking external substances, but actually immersing ourselves in these sublime experiences that awaken our you know, inner sort of mind and body spirit. How do we maintain? How do we prolong? How do we sustain um, those experiences? So we can live in the moment. Your work puts us in that stunned, you know, state, in that state of, you know, disrupted um, pattern of thinking, puts us in the present moment. Any, uh, you know, in, in your palette, when did you discover that was a kind of a tool that you could apply to work and also maybe to life? Well, you know, coming from Peru, of course, you know, I have tried um, all the drugs possible, you know, cocaine and you, everything. And because also as uh, I study uh, psychology and uh, as a psychology is always supported the fact that, yes, you must write it because what about if you have, you know, a client that he has done a lot of uh, pot, right? Do you know how a person feels? So I have done a lot of pot, but what happened is that for some reason, it doesn't actually help me, my creative process. I do know that a lot of probably other colleagues, as you have many too, they, they help them. Not in my case, it doesn't. You, and because what happened is that talking, uh, you talked before about fluidity, and yes, I actually live my life very, very fluid. I'm sorry, it's, yeah, um, very fluid. So um, I feel that they, there is not any time of interruption because at the end, we are only pure energy. And that's what I feel. I feel my own energy, the vibration of my own energy. And because sometimes I don't want to even to separate myself between you know, mind and body, but <laughs> right? Yeah. It, it's just as a pure. And, and you, say, you say my energy, but maybe you also mean our energy. Our energy, yes. Passing through you. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's, uh, and I think that I actually love to be aware. It's, it's when I'm in pure awareness that I'm able to think, you know, to have a focus, to be able to have a direction in my life. Again, I'm just talking from my own experience, what it works with me. And I always have had these very special ways of living my life, philosophy, even as a mother, right? I nursed my daughter for almost four years, three years and eight months. Uh, my own mother was thinking, that, oh my God, you're like the, the Indians in the jungle. So um, no, I- No, 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 no. Please ex expand that, that story a little bit. Well, I, well, <laughs> so, um, I just, uh, things in my life, I actually have not, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I'm very structured and practical. At the same time, things happen in my life very naturally, very fluid. And nursing my daughter Shamil for uh, almost four years, it was not my intention, obviously. It just happened to be uh, evolving that way because it was wonderful for my way of living. Uh, and 
you know, I could be able to, if I wanted to go to the theater or to, to see a play, you know, if Shamil was like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I was just, you know, chichi time and that was it, right? I could continue right. looking at, you know, or listening to beautiful music, you know, publicly. So um, I, th and, 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 you know, and many other choices that I have, you know, done through my life, you know, uh, that I have informed and researched and done my own research as for example, I made a decision of not vaccinating, you know, Shamia, my daughter, you know, she doesn't have any vaccinations besides I think, you know, polio. And I, but I, at the same time, I did work a lot in her immune system, correct? Uh, so there's so many, uh, I, I have a lot of different philosophies that like, again, it has worked for me wonderful throughout my, throughout my life. And, but not necessarily my me that is good for others. I, but, I, hope, I hope you don't find my questions uh, too personal or intrusive. Oh, no, 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 no. I think that is, uh, it's uh, the reason why I'm here with you is to be authentic and to be genuine. And, and if you're going to ask me a question, I'm going to just try to answer you as honest as I, as I could be. Because that's uh, out of respect to all the wonderful people that they are, have joined us and listening to us for such a long period of time, I, you know, I hope that they are, you know, inspired at the end of this, our, our conversation. You know, as you say, these wonderful people, and I, I, I remember, of course, doing events myself, and hopefully I will continue to, but I am so excited by the energy that people bring to experiences like art experiences or uh, meditation retreats everybody brings magic yeah. to that place and you know suddenly the uh the communal feeling is quite exhilarating and and uh life-changing for some people um i'm just you know remembering that now and, and thinking about that with your work when you were um you know expecting the child and then becoming mother what happened in your studio in your studio world at that uh, time that's an interesting question john <laughs> very very interesting well i had to say that in my case again uh it was zero life absolutely my studio was covered with dust because i think that shamil took every single ounce of energy that i could have and you know, I even thought that I was finished as an artist because I could not even draw. So, but interestingly, and that, that took a long time, right? That was, uh, I think about, so I went out of the art world for many years, about maybe five, six years, six years at least. And all my friends today agree, Manessa, you know how it is, you know, it's very difficult, right? And I, uh, you know, to come back and indeed it's very difficult, but I wanted, um, I think that even if you are not active, maybe three, four months, the art world will forget you anyway. So I had to do, you know, what it was what, right. What, what is me. the art world actually? Exactly. I mean, what is the art world? Grimmer? What is the art world? So, what you know, so that, yeah. that never really was a concern of mine. Uh -huh. And so I, I was very uh, aware again, that I wanted to put, you know, the seeds, you know, in this earth very well. And, and so if I put, you know, all my attention and, perhaps Shamil became my artwork, right? And I didn't want to have to have, you know, difficulties afterwards, you know, with sex, drugs and alcohol and a lot of uh, therapy. So, um, so that's what I, that was my own decision. Now, of course, again, you know, friends were right. It was very difficult to come back for many reasons, you know, uh, you as a human being have changed. So you have to start, you know, uh, looking introspective as to who you are now. Um, the methods, you know, how, or my interests in my, in my own work have changed uh, tremendously, 360. So I have to, I have, it was basically about starting over again. It took me perhaps two years to do new work and another two years to start, you know, going, you know, uh, and my work becoming a little more, uh, you know, public and opportunities to come. But, you know, uh, again, when you choose to be an artist, you, in my case, I wanted to be an artist for life. 
So this was just, you know, part of, you know, my, my mountain climbing, right? It's one step at a time. So um, uh, I wouldn't be the artist that I am now if I wouldn't have had my daughter, Shamil. So one goes with the other. No regrets. Yeah. Um, the work that you were doing before Shamil and after, mm. what, what was going on, it, you know, in, in forms, in the forms and in the, in, in this, in this, in the, what was going on? Mm, you know, before Shamil, I was starting to, um, I was talking a little bit with Jeff before and I was starting to, I, 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 I was very lucky uh, what I got an NEA, you know, with a, a very large amount. I, I think it was one of the last years that the NEA was active to give, you know, um, grants to individual artists. And then I also got a travel grant pilot. And so with all, with those sums, I, I took a trip to Africa. And that was very decisive in my, in, in my life because that was a dream of mine to go to Africa. And that's when I start to look into a switch to going little by little to sculpture. And I started working with handmade paper, but with three dimensional, right? And so then it came Shamil, that was about maybe five years that I didn't do any artwork, right? No drawings, nothing. You're talking about not even uh, sketches. So when I went back to the studio, um, but before I got birth, it happens to be that I took a cast of my uh, of myself, and then it was it, it was it, when I was about one week before I got birth, almost nine months, and it, the the title was "You Cannot Feel It, I Wish You Cool." So it was about discussing about male pregnancy because I always thought that male are very curious to know, to feel or to know what a pregnancy might be about, and so. That's what I did right before Shamir was born. So what I did is when I came back, I, I, start, I start with something that was familiar with me, which was the handmade paper and utilizing this cast. And I, I did 11 casts of this, um, uh, my own body with the head of, uh, you know, art dealer friend of mine and the music. And then I collaborate with for the first time with a musician uh, if anyone that is interested in music, uh, her name is Michelle Enenacello. She's quite noted and she's um, an amazing um, uh, artist. And she did the music for this piece. And that's how I started. That's how I came back. And then I started doing a lot of sculpture work with what I knew how to with this handmade paper. And I did that maybe for the next two, three years. And then afterwards, uh, I stopped completely paper and then I went into working with polycarbonate and working more directly with light. So it has been a transition. I once asked the um, city, city planner and architect, Denise Scott Brown, who was um, partners with Robert Venturi. I once asked her what her sensation and experience was as a woman applying her sensibilities and feminine consciousness to city planning and, and architecture. And she said something quite stunning. She said, and she got very animated and like her body got warm and you could feel everybody, everybody on the, on the set, my, my crew, were totally impressed with what happened to Denise in that interview. But she suddenly just described how she created, she, she said, well, one of these experiences was, I realized that in a village, you have two roads where they cross. And this is where all the, uh, the gatherings occur. People meet, they talk, they conduct business, they have affairs, you know, romance, you know, it all happens at this intersection where they meet. So she decided to create these vertical meeting places in buildings so that the core of the building was based on this sort of 
potential of intersection. And for her, this was her sort of expression of the complexity of her uh, female body awareness. And it was just so emotional and beautiful. So when we had Ann Waldman on the show back in November, the poet Ann Waldman, um, we discussed with Ann how having had a child helped her or in some way sprung into this sort of feeling of being connected to the world, more a feeling of real interconnectivity and interdependence with the world. And then from that experience, wanting to be accountable and um, you know, nurturing of the world is very, very amazing. So it sounds like this is uh, somewhat um, what your experience might have been like too. Well, um, I tell you something, you know, it's hard to describe, you know, what is, what having a child is. It's, it's, uh, it's something that you have to, you know, experience. And well, I look, was- Just a moment, look at the screen. You see Alex and Pau? No, I don't see it. He's waving. He's he has the baby in his arms. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> wow. Yes, it's it's it's. Uh, you know, I I wouldn't be. I mean, and I, you're talking about uh, I, as a woman. I was not really interested in having a child. It was not one of, you know, uh, how could I say? Uh, I was not even thinking. And but I I. I had to say as well that I don't think I would be the person that I am if I wouldn't have had Shamiel. She made me have a different vision about you know, the world, understand it differently, trying to be a better person myself, right? Because I wanted she to have a good example as well. So I, 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 for me was, uh, was a very, very important path that I took and uh, a decision, like I, like I said, I, it took six years that I was not involved in making any art. So she became the artwork. And I had, I had to say that um, that transcends in my work with the community, right? You become more understanding, you want, you want to share uh, everything what you have, because as a mother, you have a tremendous amount of generosity. And that transcends, I, I feel when I'm working, you know, with all of these different types of, you know, uh, individuals and with different cultures, you know, when I have to go outside the country to work with um, you know, people with an, from other religions as well. And, and so it makes you much more patient also, something that I, I, I believe that they say that it's a virtue and, and I happen to have probably none before Sham, Shamil was born and, I, and now it just comes naturally. <laughs> on demand. <laughs> demand, exactly. Patience on demand, P-O-D, yeah. P-O-D. Yeah, exactly. Um, the darkness seems to be a, a medium uh, mm -hmm. that you're also sculpting or weaving um, darkness. You, 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 your, your work as, as, as it is light requires, at, I think, quite a bit uh, on darkness. And I think it was recently, I remembered that Martin Luther King said that, you know, we need the dark to see the light mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, again, coming back to you know, civil unrest, uh, civil injustice, um, inequality, oppression, um, these times that can be quite challenging uh, that we often perceive as darkness. What, what is your sort of, uh, you know, uh, how would you describe your experience of, of dark and lightness in your work and in your life? Hmm. You know, I think that uh, I have always, since I was very young, and I will say, uh, I don't know, maybe since I was 15, 14, 13, I have always 
had to say that I have brainwashed myself with positivism. And so I always have been aware that there is a darkness side for everything, but that's not where my focus have gone. And I tell you why. And that's the reason why if you go to see, for example, any work that I have done, when you go during the day or through the, uh, through the time, uh, transcourse of the day, you know, as you know, light keeps changing. So the work not necessarily requires the night, the darkness, for you to be able to have uh, a communication with it. Why I say that? Because when you see the work, you will also see, for example, the, the images of a seal screen, you know, embedded, or you will see the shapes or the different size of the domes or the different colors of the travel structure or the direction. So not necessarily, uh, and I did that purposely because I didn't want people to, exactly. This is a very good, for uh, thank you, uh, John and Emily from showing this work. This is a perfect example that this piece, for example, looks very different during the day than at night, but it's still you're able to have those, uh, that translucity that you see during the day that you won't see that at night. So I like to think that not necessarily I require the night in order for me to be able to people see the light uh, on the work. In this case, for example, this is a very special uh, situation for the work because the, the work has not only uh, light from within, but also uh, the outside of the domes that there was, um, what I did is I, I work with a different type of poly, polycarbonate that will reflect, the seal screen was done re reflective. So all the LCD screens that they were with all the advertisement, they would be also reflecting all around the piece. So at every second, you will see how it will change it. And obviously throughout the time that the piece was there as well, because I, as you know, all the advertisement keeps evolving and changing constantly. So um, I, I like to see that normally uh, life is like, a you know, uh, water is very important to me. I was growing in uh, very near the Pacific Ocean and I always was fascinated by the horizon line. And I think that I, if I felt any moments of darkness, I would throw it all out in the ocean. And I would like it see metaphorical how the waves will take it, right? You know, and, and I yeah. would even having these conversations with the ocean I said, don't bring them back to me, take them very far away. So um, that's, that's, that's how I think about darkness. Krimanesha, you, you, I, am I correct in recalling that you have done a, a TED talk? Yes, correct. Is, the, is there some way that you can share perhaps the message or the essence of the TED Talk with us? And um, is that in any way related to your experience of going to Bhutan? Um, no, it has no relationship with Bhutan, but okay. I have to say it was the most difficult thing that I have done in my whole entire life. You know, you, when you give lectures, you always have the butterflies, at least myself, the butterflies in my tummy. But I'm telling you here, I told the organizers that I wanted to be one of the first ones, you know, to have my talk and not to wait the whole week because I still want to have my cocktails and I still wanted to enjoy. Otherwise, I was going to be yeah. you know, all, like mortified. You know, it's difficult for many reasons, John, you know, and not only because, uh, you, you know, forget about the amount of people that they could be there, but it's, uh, you have to memorize you know, every single word. Sure. And it's a, it's a lot, it's a, it's a big chunk of, uh, of time. Well, we, another day we could talk about all why it was one of the most difficult things that I have done. But needless to say, it doesn't have any relationship with Bhutan. Uh, Ted was exclusively uh, to, they wanted to know about my personal story. Uh, how a person that came, I guess, when I was like 20 years old to New York City, not knowing anyone, could be doing, you know, maybe some installations that I'm that I was doing at the moment, right. and also they they were very curious as to how I did my lighting sequences and the relationship that I had with the, with architecture. That was in base the the reason why I gave the tech talk. 
Krimanasa, before we open the, um, and by the way, it's a very, I always say it's intimidating to have such a small amount of time, you know, to, uh, to embrace um, someone's life and work, but it's just uh, perhaps just a, the key on the door, you know, to, to all that you are and, and that you do. But thank you very much for this. And uh, I just want to ask in, at the end of our, you know, sort of dialogue, um, who were your mentors in sort of becoming um, a, a cultural force uh, on your own? Hmm. Well, well, I had to say Madre Teresa. Right. Um, and then my mother. Yeah. Uh, Madre Teresa, I was obsessed with Madre Teresa. If you come, you know, to uh, my studio and you go to the bathroom, there's like so many pictures of Madre Teresa, you know, and because I wanted to be like Madre Teresa. Obviously, I was always, uh, since I was uh, very young, maybe eight, nine, ten years old, I was doing a lot of community outreach on the weekends, you know, um, or after school to go to hospitals and help, you know, reading stories to children or drawing and doing murals, for example. And so I wanted to be by my Teresa. And then, but thank God, a friend of mine, like you came one day to visit me, a friend came and he says, Grimanesa, you know, you got to realize that you are not Mother Teresa. And so, because you like too much to drink your wine and you like too much <laughs> your shoes and you like all these little extra things. And, and to be Mother Teresa, you have to live like Mother Teresa, right? And so that was, um, that was very important, that moment for me, because I realized, wow, absolutely. I have to discover who really is Grimanesa Amoros, right? And, and then I will say my mother, because uh, I think she taught me so many, so many things. Uh, she gave me such a guidance and inspired me to be the righteous person that I am now. And the love that, you know, living uh, in Peru, she made me realize that we were all we were all the same. That no matter you know what color we were or where we're coming from, you treat the king of uh, England the same way as the person that is selling the meat. And so I grew up with such a good, um, Rachel's wonderful mother that uh, I carry with her until now all the things that she taught me. And you know, thankfully she is still alive. So we have still, you know, conversations and. Do you feel, Grimanessa, that more or less you are a total person living a total life? <sighs> well, I consider myself as a human that have a body, but as I'm very aware that we are pure energy and as pure energy, we never get destroyed. We will keep on continuing for who knows how long. And I try, uh, I always have the philosophy as many of us probably, the past is done, the future is uncertain. You know, we don't know what's gonna happen. The present moment is what is important to me. And I really feel every day living at my fullest, that yes. Since the moment I wake up, I never said, oh my God, you know, all the things I have to do, no. It's like, yes. Great. Oh my God. I can't wait to start. I can't wait to see uh, Dara. I can't wait to see Shayu. I can't wait to be at the studio, um, you know, uh, sharing what I love to do most. And, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful that I have that, that love and, and I would say perhaps desire to do things and passion for life and, and love what I do. That's the most important. Um, being a little sensitive to our schedule, sure. And uh, you know the other other minds and hearts in the room. Um, and I know the people on Facebook <laughs> always have questions and comments to make, so we can visit them later, perhaps on Facebook. But if, you know, perhaps someone here uh, in the Zoom meeting tonight um, would like to add a comment or. Uh, perhaps ask a question of Grimanesa. 
Uh, and I have dozens more questions, um, but I don't want to be too selfish. So um, I think we have Marriott here and Ron Smith, I think was leaving at 515. Um, Jeff is over there in Dutchess County. Uh, Grimanesha, is there something that you would like to share with us tonight before we say goodbye? Uh, and, and perhaps while people are thinking about other comments or questions. Um, I think, you know, what you just mentioned before about uh, trying not to be sometimes selfish and uh, the desire of doing good for others and, and sharing what you know to do best, right? You know, whatever it's a doctor, it's an artist, it's a, you know, a visual artist or a filmmaker uh, or a person that is in finance, um, it's always important to try to see uh, how others are gonna, they, they are, how others are benefiting at that particular moment of all the things that we are doing. That's something that I always have on mind. Yeah, so me, many too. me too. Could you, mm -hmm. could you ask her about the body? Does she see those works with the central channel? Can you? Okay. Emily, as a, mm -hmm. a really... Uh, yes, very, Emily, I didn't, I didn't hear well. What is that? John, are you oh, muted? Oh, I'm, I have to mute myself, Grimanessa, because believe it or not, we're in the same room. Okay, I hear you, Emily. Okay. There's, there's a little yeah, feedback, okay. Uh, Minessa, thank you so much for this presentation of your work. Um, I, John was saying that one of the experiences he had when seeing your work was this idea of the central channel of the body energy and energy channel. And I was wondering if, I don't know if you two had spoken about that at all, but I was wondering if that's something you're thinking about as you're Chakras. making the work. The yes. pieces with the light. Well, you know, I'm, I'm constantly thinking how to evolve, right? Um, we were discussing a little bit earlier with, you know, wonderful human being, Jeffrey, he's a collector you know, of my work. I, when he collected my work, I was a painter. So I'm constantly trying to evolve. And then now I'm trying, I'm already thinking ways in, in which I could share with you the light without having to have a physical structure, right? So that's, that's where my work is going. Um, about uh, myself as a human, I think that um, it helps me the traveling that I do because it's when I learn the most, uh, not only from the cities or the buildings, but mostly from the people, their cultures, I, that only enriches me. And it's something that I feel that nobody is gonna be able to take away because as you know, any material things that we could own, we'll have them now, but who knows tomorrow, they could be all gone. But what you have on yourself as a center of the human that you are, nobody could take away, right? All those experiences. So um, I basically have, you know, spend always all my money sometimes, you know, in traveling since I was young. I, I started traveling when I was 16. And um, I, I think that it has contributed to the development of me growing as a human being and centering you know, my own energy. Yes, uh, I feel that I'm very much in balance and I'm very, very aware about things that I want in life. I, since I was very young, I always, I, I knew what I want and I, and they might not be the right things, but I never doubted, you know, that, that those, those were the things that I wanted to go in that particular moment. Uh, I know that health has been always very important to me. And, uh, you know, of course, what we do with our love, nothing. And, you know, of course, money is necessary because otherwise we wouldn't be able to succeed. We, are, we have to be in reality. So I'm just sharing things that, you know, goes through my mind and of an every day of my life. Well, and when you talk about 
uh, Grimanesha, um, the past and the present and the future. You know the expression, um, you know, get over yourself. You heard that expression? Of course. Getting over yourself. So, mm -hmm. so in a way, it's like, you know, the past, what, like if we can get over ourselves, then the past doesn't define us. We're free yes. to draw from the past, from delightful experiences, from traumatic experience, to draw from those experiences, the materials and the wisdom in the present moment to bring into the future. So the past is not to be rejected, you mm -hmm. know, or forgotten, mm -hmm. but to remember, it's like, you know, you have a great capital. Of course. Of, of, of experience uh, that's part of our palette. Mm -hmm. And so no, what, I, what I meant when I spoke about past is not something to be forgotten. It's just that mm -hmm. perhaps we particularly, we cannot do nothing to change the past, but the past is very important because it informs us about things that they are quite important to understand, you know, our present where we are, right? I think that, you know, uh, how, uh, History is quite, I, it's always something that we always have to have in consideration, right? Uh, I don't think that people will want it to forget about, for example, the Holocaust and what it happens there. And, and or the new generations uh, should be informed about what happened, you know, uh, at that particular time and uh, moment is part of our history. So yes, I agree with you 100%. It is not there to be forgotten. Yes, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, and Susan is actually here with me. She's just off, off camera. Oh, um, my adorable Susan. <laughs> because you're talking about past and present and future, was Susan was just thinking, because we've noted that our meeting you 35 years ago and our, our love of both your art and you all these many years, do you ever see in the circle of your work coming back to two-dimensional work again, uh, like your painting as you originally started out, or, or do you think you're, you're sort of irrevocably down that road of of, of more three-dimensional expression of your art, or? Yeah, no, that uh, that is a romance with the unknown. Okay. Yep. I I, I don't know. I, I, I will go back. I mean, it will be, uh, it's something that I wouldn't close myself and I will tell you, no, absolutely yeah. not. No, the possibilities are there. Yes, 100%. Uh, I will tell you just as a compliment, we are about to move and leave Dutchess County and head off to other parts. But every time we look at a house we're about to buy, we look at the wall oh, space. Okay. <laughs> and we say, oh. where can we hang this? And where can we hang that? And in addition to Enchanted Forest, you may remember those very large other paintings we got from you of, I will call them like a pirate sort of scene. And so we have, we need very large uh, walls to prominently enjoy some of the larger works of yours oh. that we have, in addition to the lovely smaller works. So. Yes, it's a, uh, I, indeed, I, and then the most important is that I, I always have been very grateful, you know, uh, people that have always, you know, support, you know, uh, what I love to do most. And that's something that's incredible uh, that, I, that I hope that every artist at some point of their life experience, right? Uh, because it's not that it's required for you to do your work. You're going to do the work regardless, but it's just, um, it's beautiful to have the, the support that somebody understands that psychic, that enchanted forest and yeah. that you have done. So yeah. thank you. Well, we have loved your imagination and your intensity all these years. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Susan, how about yes, a little, how a little, how a little, how a little pick from me? Mm. Oh, we just knocked something off the kitchen counter. You see? Um, the, when you were, I guess it was the Iceland trip, and then you did that installation 
um, sculpture, and I think uh -huh. it was either seaweed or kelp, and you walked into a room, and it was like walking around these waves of, and they were moving at the time, and that that was an installation piece. But where do those pieces then go? Yes, that's Are a very good, that's a very good question. Gallery? That was a very good question, Susan. That actually, I have those pieces because uh, I, I, as I mentioned at some point of the uh, of our conversation with John, that was the time that I was researching a lot about handmade paper, right? So yes. if you compare the work that I did, you cannot feel I wish you could, those 11, uh, you know, bodies, uh, that was with the same uh, type of handmade paper, abaca and cotton. It's just the way it's beaten and how long it was. It happens to be that rootless algas was, I think about maybe the amount uh, much shorter about how the fibers are being, you know, technically, you know, mixed. But that, no, I have that work with me. That, that, that work um, it was showing a lot and it, it's just extremely uh, challenged and a lot, a lot of work to hang. So I myself retired it because I was, I was very, very, very tired of keep on uh, hanging them. So I, I put them in a box and, and um, just until recently, you know, it's very funny, coincidence of life, maybe about two weeks ago, I was uh, reorganizing, you know, my storage. And then I came up with the box that says rootless algas, very, very, very coincidental. And but it's, it's, it's a large installation, so that's why it has to, you know, for now, you know, remain, you know, uh, in the box until, you know, I, 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 might, I might re, you, you know, use it, you know, in the future again. It, need, it needs to come up to the Hudson River Valley for another, you know, the whole <laughs> artist area up here is up and coming. All the New Yorkers are leaving the city, flocking up here. Oh yes, yes, indeed. It, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful piece, and it needs to be seen again, especially yeah. by me. No, no, no. It's true. <laughs> it's true. No, it's uh, like I said. It's between you and me. Very, very challenging to install. Yeah. But it's 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 amazing. It has uh, I'll I'll share you know with John other images of that installation. I mean, that's how you've made so many um, short films and uh, video projects. Yes. Can you just take yes. a moment to perhaps. Um, Tell us a little bit about that and, and uh, we'll give people another opportunity to consider uh, any other contributions they want to make or questions. Um, thank you, uh, Jeff and Susan. That's really so beautiful to have you here. And uh, as the twilight ends in the upper uh, northern area of, you know, North America here. Um, I, I, the videos were, um, uh, were part Every time I had an exhibition, John, I also would have an, a video because it was in the, in the gallery or in, this, in, the, in the space, uh, there was always like a project room. And um, it was another way of working with light, correct? And images. So, uh, and what I love also was the time of the collaboration with the composer, with the artist that was gonna be doing the music for the work. And I have been very, very, very lucky. I have worked with wonderful, noted um, uh, composers and musicians, uh, you know, along the road. Wow, I, I didn't, you know, really uh, understand the music element there, and that's yeah. that's really, yeah, really yeah. important. Yeah, the music was that, and then uh, basically, obviously, the 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 film, the video related. You know, to the exhibition. I just uh, just recently, you know, uh, finished one video that I still it was um, had to relationship with Italy and the Civita di Vanoreggio, you know, a city up on the mountain, and it was shown uh, the World Monument Fund, but unfortunately, you know, it has to wait a little bit. So, can we find videos on your website? Yes. Okay. Right. And maybe Emily can add the website to the chat box and we'll add it into Facebook uh, and YouTube later. Um, I understand that there's this very um, intrinsic um, sort of 
sensitivity that you give to the spaces, the places, the cultures where your work grows and lives. Um, and I know you made a beautiful work about the, um, the, the Peruvian island where they use oh, the yeah. weaving. Yes, there were as, silent. Just as one example, perhaps you could turn us on a little bit, sensitize us to your um, working method. Uh, well, uh, I, I always knew that I was not going to be living in Peru. So I traveled inside the, my country quite a lot. And then afterwards, South America consecutively. So, but the only place that I have not been was uh, Puno, where the Uros Islands were. So it's just quite difficult because the weather is not so time so cooperative, right? It could be very cold and it's not really the right times. So, but one day uh, about, I think maybe 2000, I can't remember, recall 2010 or 11, I, I said to myself, my name is Nogri Manesa if I don't go to the Uros Island. And so of course, you know, in Puno. So of course everybody says it's not the right time, you know, right now. And anyway, regardless, I went. And, it happens to be that it create again, it was another transformative you know, time in my work as it was with the light. It was the, oh, these floating Uros islands that they were there seen, made um, all by the Totoris where they are these giant plant stalks, right? Um, these Uros, people that they live there for 3000 years make their houses, the, starting with the islands, then their houses, watchtowers, boats, and then uh, in, including they eat it. So uh, one of the fascinating uh, experiences also to walk in these islands, right? How uneven, you know, these could be. So it is because, as you know, they're maintained by themselves, by the Uros themselves, because Otherwise, these uh, plant stalks, they rotten, right? They disintegrate, sure, then sure. the island disappeared. Decompose. So, yeah. decompose. so I started getting uh, very much, again, talking about awareness about how could I make sure that these islands keep now keep disappearing as they used to be maybe 400 and now they were, uh, I don't know. Uh, at that time, I think that they were like 23. I don't know, they, 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 they reduced quite a lot. I don't have the right numbers per se. And so when I came from New York uh, to New York, uh, I had the opportunity just two days after uh, to do, they called me from the armory and to make a proposal because they were the first time that they were collaborating with Times Square. And so they were calling two other, you know, the other three artists, you know, I was the fourth one. And then, uh, and two proposals. And I said, oh my God, Imagine Times Square. I always wanted to be there. I used to be going there with my phone, you know, headphones to listen to music. And so, again, what was going to differentiate my, perhaps my work from all these other wonderful artists, right? And I decided to do something that was very close to my heart at that moment, which was my Uros experience. And that's what it came Uros House, the piece that you see in Times Square. I wanted to do, I wanted to share my cultural heritage, you know, with the New Yorkers to learn more about the, my, my, my own culture, but also about the Uros as a, as a culture. And then it's a house. And in a house, you know, as you know, you know, you share this, uh, people gather together for, you know, to eat, you know, there's, uh, they, they're sharing this community. As a matter of fact, inside, I don't know if you could see from that image, you could, there's a lot of pieces that the viewer also could take with them. Uh, so that's how uh, the Uros Islands and the exhibition you know, started it. Uh, right afterwards, I, I did one in, East, in, I think, Israel with Jane Farber. She was at that time the MIT director for many, many years. And she was the one that created this exhibition. And that was when I was able to do many Uros islands on the floors of the gallery, right? So that's how if you, that, that's what you see the seal screen. The seal screen basically is the parallel to the Totora reeds. I don't, I don't hear you. 
here we have a radiator that makes lots of noise. I see. So <laughs> I don't hear anything. I don't hear anything. It's only yeah. you. Anyway, this idea that people can take a piece of the island with them. Yes. Times Square, a piece of the culture mm -hmm. from Peru, mm -hmm. which maybe becomes the, you know, the creation of a new culture or a new germination, you know, of this, of this ancient ancient uh, ancient life, ancient culture, ancient wisdom, and yeah. love for the planet, yeah. interdependency with the planet. Yeah, it's important. I always uh, feel fascinating on putting, you know, people together to meet each other. And, um, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing, you know, what uh, love and kindness could do. I mean, we could talk about Bhutan, for example, that finally I made it about, no less, I think last year, no, the year before, I made it and talk about a utopia. I mean, truly, truly, Bhutan is a country that lives in, in a utopia. It's, it's really a bubble of love and kindness. It's incredible. Everyone that you speak, uh, they love their king and queen. Uh, they even carried it here in, in, in bottoms, all of them. And because they wanted it, there's no, there's no required that they have to, you know, put the pin. And, and basically, uh, for me, it was essential that trip to Bhutan because it reminded me about how important and how far kindness could go, how much more of an impact you do with kindness, right? You know, the national, the gross national product of Bhutan is kindness. Yes. It's considered the gross national product. You see, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's incredible. I was there for almost a month and I, I think I, uh, it's, uh, it's really talking about transformative. Yes, indeed. It really, you know, if you're a sensitive human being, you will come back transformed because also the nature, nature is extremely transformative is, you know, the rivers are how probably they, our rivers used to be in their 40s, right? They're completely transparent, they're beautiful. So um, imagine if we could share a little bit more Bhutan to the world. Grimanesha, I have a question for you. This is our, our um, more conceptual process art moment of the show. Are you using two monitors in your house right there? No, yes. what? Because your camera is on a, is a camera separate? The camera? Yes. Yeah. Do you know where your camera is? Yes. Can you look at your camera? Now, I'm looking to my camera. Right. Now, if you listen to me and look at the camera, yes. then everybody can see you straight on. And I just want to ask you one final question. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Like that, you mean? No, right at the lens, at the camera lens, there. Okay, right there, right there is the lens. There we are, it's like ABC News. Yeah, and you know why, right? Because what happened <laughs> is that you talk about, you know, I'm very technical and then it drives me crazy because you know, the, 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 the camera of the computer, you know, is very fussy, right? And, and it's not sharp. So I, I always use another camera. I just have got used to. You, 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 you troublemaker artist, you. Hmm. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> but what I was going to say is that you're, the way you describe your work going around the world, mm -hmm. it's like you go around the world and you, you cultivate aspects of culture. So you're a kind of transport vehicle. Your work becomes like a transport vehicle of, you know, our, you know, our, our world culture. Mm. You're like a cultural um, anthropologist mm. in a way through your work. And I think that's quite, quite a beautiful image um, mm. that I, I, I get from, from our, our talk tonight too. Nature, nature is very important to me. Extremely, extremely important. So thank you, Griminessa. You've been a blessing for us. The mother Teresa of the tuning fork. <laughs> That's a, good, that's, a good, that's a good story, isn't it? Yes, mm -hmm. lots of good stories. Yes, I still like my wine. Well, let's, let's have a little wine. In the meantime, we can, we can say, say goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so much, uh, Emily and, and, and John, 
for having uh, the opportunity to be in your platform. And um, it's, it's, it's quite a, a wonderful experience to be able to share your thoughts, your philosophies and what you think and what you have done through such a long period of life. And uh, I hope that you continue doing this. It's very, very important. And um, you'll have always my support. And, it's a, and John, thank you for having this surprise of um, Susan and Jeff. As you know, imagine, we are not gonna say the years, how many, right? But uh, it has been a beautiful surprise. Thank you, Susan and, and Jeffrey for joining us and being with us tonight. Please say hello to Bill. We love you and we miss you. Thank you so much. So should I just go off now? No, Grimanesha, Emily and I have a 8 p.m. deadline for a $200,000 grant okay. for the Institute. Okay. Wonderful. So, so I'm going to hang out very quickly. We hope to continue. Perfect. Thank you to everybody. Bye-bye. A presto. Thank you.